Okay, so our next phylum in our journey in the invertebrates are the Nadarians. And we're moving up the evolutionary ladder here. These Nadarians include the jellyfish, the hydroids, and the sea anemones in the corals. So the fancy language for that would be the hydrozoa for the hydroids, would be the scyphozoa for the jellyfish, the anthozoa for the corals and sea anemones, and then one other group, the cubozoa, which are the box jellies. So as we said before, we're going to be taking a look at the type of symmetry that these organisms have, their level of organization, what kind of specialized cells they have, and what are the two basic forms or what are the morphs that the nadarians have. So in terms of symmetry, these have the most simple kind of symmetry we can see. It's radial symmetry. You can cut them in any way you want and you'll have the same on one side as the other. So they're radially symmetrical. Every nadarian has nidocytes which include these stinging cells called nematocysts, and we'll check in more later. But you can see that they've got barbs here, and they are filled with venom. So this group has two basic forms. This first form is the polyp. You can see that it's upright, it's attached, but it's got its tentacles at the top. The second form is the medusa. This is the sw swimming form. It's really kind of a polyp upside down. It's got its tentacles down here, and oral arms, and it floats around in the water column. Lots of evolutionary first with this group. They have something called the gastrovascular cavity. This means that they actually bring their food in here after they capture it. They secrete enzymes, and those enzymes digest the food in that gastrovascular cavity. It's like a primitive stomach. So they're the first group to show extracellular digestion, and it's found in both the polyp form and the medusa form. Then we have to look at them from the level of complexity. How do they accomplish their structural or skeletal support? Do they even have nerve control? Remember, the sponges did not, but this is the first group with some nervous system uh, organization. How do they accomplish their feeding and digestion? I just told you about their digestion here. What's the circulation system like? How do they get rid of wastes? And how do they move themselves around? So, we're going to take a look at their nervous system. This is the first group to have a nervous system. They have what we call a nerve net. This nerve net is this uh, mesh-like network of fibers that runs through both the bell and it also runs through, if we look here, the body of the polyp form. This diffuse nerve net is composed of cells that can communicate with one another and they coordinate the actions of the entire organism. It's also the first group to show a primitive circulatory system. You can see here there are these radial canals right here, and there are also these ring canals here. Both of those are parts of this primitive circulatory system. It doesn't have a heart, doesn't have arteries or veins, but it does have these radial canals that circulate fluids around the body. In the nadarians, they don't have spicules like the sponges did, but they do have a material that acts sort of like their skeleton, and that is this mesoglea here. That's the jelly in the realm of the jellyfish. All right, so that's the structural support, and it acts kind of like the fluid in a waterbed does. So it gives it structural support by being in between the inner and outer body walls. Believe it or not, these are jet propelled. They may be slow moving and some of them are completely planktonic, but they can, when they're in the medusa form, they can contract their bell and force water out, which is basically a jet. A slow moving one at that. So as I mentioned before, these have two basic forms. They've got the medusa form here, and they have the polyp form here. This is the attached, the medusa is the free floating form. And what's also interesting is that many of them alternate between the medusa form and the polyp form in an alternation of generations life cycle, similar to that found in the algae. The hydrozoans are the first group, the hydroids, that we're going to look at in the nadarians. And these have two different kinds of polyps on them. They've got the reproductive polyps, which are the gonozoids. They are found right here. They produce new medusae, and then they have the gastrozoids, and those gastrozoids are feeding polyps. They are the part of the organism that sticks out in the water, has got the stinging cells. Those stinging cells capture their prey, and then they digest their prey, and then the prey's digestive fluids get carried throughout the column, which connects all the different members of the colony 
uh, and give nutrients to the different parts of the hydroid colony. So here we see that we've got the feeding polyp right there and we also have the reproductive polyp right here. So those are just a little bit closer view. The feeding polyps are connected by this little internal canal here uh, which brings the food materials to the rest of the organism so that uh, <clears throat> the food captured by one pulp can feed the whole colony. So here's the basic alternation of generations life cycle that we find in the Nadarians. We have the polyp form here. This polyp form undergoes asexual reproduction in which medusae are butted off and they're released out into the water. They swim around. This is the free swimming form. It lives its part of the life cycle and then it will release sperm and egg out into the water. Those sperm and egg fertilize and then they develop into the zygote and then down to the planula larvae. That larvae settles to the bottom, attaches, and then becomes a polyp over time and then the cycle repeats itself. So what you see is that we have the alternation between sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction in this particular alternation of generations life cycle. And the alternating forms are the polyp and the medusa. So remember we have three major groups of Nidarians that we're going to be looking at. The hydrozoans, the group we've looked at a little bit so far. Then we have the scyphozoans, which are the true jellyfish. And we have the anthozoans, which are the corals and sea anemones. How we differentiate between those has to do with their dominant body form, whether they've got more medusa in their life cycle than polyp, their life cycle or reproductive strategies, do they even have both generations uh, in their particular cycle, and then how much mesoglea does the medusa form have, and how long does it live. The hydrozoans have a dominant polyp stage and a reduced medusa stage, so they spend most of their life here in this polyp form attached to the ground, but they do release their medusa buds, those medusa buds move out into the water column, but they have a fairly short generation uh, life cycle stage and they're also really small relative to other medusa forms. So the hydrozoan medusa, they are smaller than other medusa, they have less mesoglea, less jelly, and they also have a muscular kind of shelf around the bottom of the bell. Some of them even remain attached to the polyp form for their stage of the life cycle. Additionally, these hydrozone medusa lack cells in the mesoglial part of the bell. So these hydrozoans are colonial, as we mentioned before, and many of them have separate feeding parts and reproductive parts on the stalk working together to carry out the colonial life of the organism. Some hydroids have the feeding part connected to the same pulp or in the same pulp as the reproductive parts. So these small structures here are the reproductive parts for this particular polyp and they're on the same polyp as the feeding part of the organism. We have the special names for these. This is a gastrozoid, gastro meaning to eat, right? And then the gonozoids, um, these are the reproductive polyps. Sometimes the hydroids are free living all by themselves, attached to some seaweed or some piece of dock or some piling of the substrate. Other times they live on the back of a hermit crab in a nice symbiotic relationship. To add just a little more detail to their internal anatomy, the key thing here is that we look at the cenosarc. The cenosarc is the part of the internal structure of the hydrozoan that connects the feeding polyps to the other parts of the organism so that all of the parts of the organism can be nourished. The outer part, the parasarch, is the external skeleton, if you will, of the uh, hydroid colony, and together the cenosarch and the parasarch are called the hydrocolis. Sometimes the parasarch, that outer coating, can be made of calcium carbonate, as is found in this one here, uh, or it can be more of a flexible chitinous exoskeleton like you find in the insects and the crustaceans. So this is the fire coral. Some people have seen those. They are actually hydrozoans and not true corals themselves. They have just a mild enough sting to cause you just a little bit of irritation should you touch one with your bare skin. Ecologically speaking, these are sea slugs here, and the sea slugs 
are feeding on the hydroids. They eat the hydroids, they take their stinging cells, and they actually don't digest them. They move them to the gills on their back that are sticking up off their back, and they incorporate those stinging cells into their body, and it makes them unpalatable to their potential predators. So it's a great co-opted defense mechanism from the sea slug eating the hydrozoan stinging cells. Some other unusual hydrozoans, these are actually floating colonies called siphonophores, and these siphonophores are um, organisms that you might be familiar with, like the Portuguese man-of-war, the blue bottle, the by-the-wind sailor. Uh, these are all floating colonial hydroids. The upper part of the colony is the part that sticks up above the water. This acts like a sail and moves the colony along. Down below, there are all these individual feeding and reproductive polyps below the upper part of the colony. But each thing hanging down is its own individual member of the colony. The colony itself has a mouth opening, and each of the uh, parts of the floating colony have their own particular job. The things that are hanging down from the Portuguese man of war, we've got reproductive polyps here. That's their sole job is to do the reproductive part for the organism. Then we also have the gastrozoids. These are the feeding polyps. They actually do the digestion. And then the dactylzoids. These are the part of the organism that actually specializes in capturing prey. Around here in the northeast, we've got a lot of very small hydroids around. We have the wine glass hydroid and that one we'll see floating off of algae or attached to docks, the same with the garland hydroid. You might look at these and not even know that they were animals. And what would a presentation be without a little bit of jellyfish humor? Here we have a hydrozoan who's fallen in love with a scyphozoan. And what will be their fate? That is the question.